Okay, uh, state of mind. Um, I'm very, very excited. I can't tell you how excited I am. Um, first of all, if you, please subscribe. I know that I used to just kind of throw it away, but I need you guys to subscribe because I'm doing so many things now that you guys just help me out a little bit. Thank you. Yes. So what do I have this honor? Now, I'm going I'm to say who I'm interviewing today is the CEO of DBSA. And if you had, I'm getting a little emotional, um, just because if you had said to me 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that I would be interviewing the CEO of DBSA, I would have probably said, no way. <laughs> um, he's a great man. He's the man. And he does incredible things for bipolar, depression, everything. So I am honored. And I think you guys are going to learn a lot today because I, I have... I have a feeling that I'm going to go real deep. Anyway, let's get to it. Um, how you doing, Michael Pollock? I'm doing very well. I love that name, Michael Pollock. <laughs> give, give me that name. You can, you can, we can share it. We can share it. <laughs> um, first of all, what does DBSA stand for? The Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Okay. The original name was NDMDA, the National Depression and Manic Depression Association. But we don't use the term manic depression anymore. We use the term That's bipolar. That's right. And so several years ago, the name changed to Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, and we're known for our acronym, DBSA. I love DBSA. When I was first, uh, the story goes... When I escaped from the mental institution, um, they didn't know what I had. They didn't know. They were just like, you know, we don't know. We don't know. Maybe drugs. Maybe this. Maybe that. They, you know. So I went through two and a half weeks in a mental institution, not knowing. I was just saying to the psychiatrist, "Just what? What, what do I have? Please give me a name." Then I escaped the hospital, and about a month later, I went to see, I'll never forget him, he was a Korean psychiatrist, his name was Dr. Noonan, and I sat with him, I was in bad shape, I weighed 129 pounds, hmm. when, I, when I went in there, I weighed 160, and I sat with him, and all he did was just look at me, look down. And I was talk. I just talked. Look down. Just do this. And I said, at the end of it, he said, uh, "Okay, you have manic depression." And I said, "Okay, wh what's that?" He said, "Don't worry. We're we're gonna take care of you." So they put me on lithium. And it, as my book says. Saved my life. So then it was called manic depression. And then it became bipolar. Um, so that said, I want who? Where'd you grow up? Let's tell me about yourself. And sure. well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm still a Steelers fan. <laughs> yes, during the '70s, um, steel curtain and all that. Um, yeah. Um, still a big Steeler fan. Um, I grew up in a family where mental health, mental illness at the time was just very prevalent. And um, literally since my birth, um, family members uh, with mental health conditions, um, it's been an experience where I, I got to witness and be part of a journey that had some pretty severe lows, but also some... Now, you had mental illness or no, just my your, family, your family? No, my family. Members of my family, oh. yeah, yeah. And in that, in that journey, 
um, you know, I, I saw some of the, the pain and the suffering and the experiences that they went through, sometimes in the hospital, the psych ward, the emergency wow. room. Being at home, laying on the couch and just finding the motivation to get out, out of bed or off the couch. Yeah, that's was a kind challenge. of de- depression you know? is where it... Yeah. And, um, but I, I've also been fortunate to see them um, um, move to a place of recovery and uh, have uh, joy in their life and go back to school and have meaningful jobs and careers and have people in their life um, that, that they could really connect with and build a life around. So I've seen both. I've seen um, the challenges and I've seen the good. Well, you know, at that time, we didn't know what it was. I mean, nobody really talked about it or, you know, obviously, same with me. Um, but I like to, as far as state of mind, I like to show people the truth mm-hmm. and then let them know that they could survive and they can become something. Yeah. There's always the darkness and you get to the light. And that's what I always try to do, not just say, oh, it's a silly. But it is tough. You saw it. I lived it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so then what? You, when did you start uh, knowing you wanted to be a part of uh, the mental illness world? So when I was in college in Ohio, um, and I left Pittsburgh, in hindsight, in part, to create some space between me and some of those experiences. Oh, really? And I had a family member um, in crisis. And like a lot of families, we didn't talk about mental health. And um, all of a sudden, I had a family member that was in crisis. And it forced us for the first time to talk about um, the individual's condition and what it meant and what was going to happen. Now, so, take, take, Michael, yeah. take me to the, the, the time that that happened. Yeah. What, did everybody have to sit down and have a discussion, or was it you just had a discussion with the person on your own? How did that work? Yeah. So um, you said you were going to go deep on this. I, <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about DBS. <laughs> um, so I was away at school, and I, um, I got a call about a week or so from a family member right before coming home for the holidays. said, just want to prepare you for what you're going to walk into. Whoa. And, um, you know, this family member's not doing well. And we're not sure what to do. And I said, well, we should figure out how to get them help. Yeah. We need you to come home and take care of this. Now, how old were you at that time? I was 19. Oh, wow. I was 19. And um, um, went home, understood the situation, called a family meeting, and uh, then learned that um, this person had a diagnosis and... Um, apparently went off their treatment and had been off their treatment for a while and no one really knew what to do about it. Um, so we tried a family intervention and wow. it, it didn't work. Um, so I went back to school. And um, that's when I realized I needed to learn more about mental health. Wow, that's beautiful. And I went to a support group. And I connected with others who either were experiencing their own mental health issues or had family members. And I realized I'm not alone. And um, that was really my first introduction to kind of thinking about the importance of mental health and the impact that its absence can have on an individual and those around them. That's a beautiful story you just told there, Michael. I'm very proud of you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. At nineteen, to so then you pr- you really pursued in school. You went to sc- uh, so it was interesting because I um, I thought you know 
I want to be a social worker, maybe a therapist. But I was in business. I was majoring uh. in business. And so um, I didn't have the fortitude to change my major. I, so I got my degree in business and uh, did what most people did when they graduated and didn't know what they wanted to do. I stayed in school for another year until um, I figured it out um, or tried to figure it out. And uh, someone said to me, you know, there's careers you could pursue in the nonprofit sector. And uh, so that's what I did. And I've spent my whole career, 30 plus years, uh, working for four different uh, nonprofit organizations, mission-based organizations, whose missions are um, you know, greater than um, making a profit, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, their missions were to give back, um, to serve the community, serve the people that they were there to serve. And, uh, you know, the, that those career paths for me prepared me for um, the role I've been playing for the last four-plus years at DBSA. I couldn't help but think, as, I, as you were talking, that you're an angel. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, no. I'll tell you why. Just just by the way you, you took this on, the nonprofit and this and that, and you've done what you've done. And I, I know another angel's coming in part two of yeah. this, which is Michelle. I just knew that already <laughs> by, by what uh, I've heard about her. But... Um, so let's get into, you got the deep part out, which is good, <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it. Um, listen guys, I'm going to say this right now. I'm, I'm, I'm working with, with Michael and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do a lot of things and I'm not, I'm not, you know, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it and we're, we're going to talk after this and it's going to we're going to have a, a great relationship because we're both passionate about the same thing and that is helping people who are struggling with mental health because we both have lived a great life you know and you can do that so dbsa let's go um so your mission was to with dbsa what did you what was your goal what did you want to do with well, I think DBSA has a really impactful mission, and that's to provide hope, help, support, and education uh, for people living with mood disorders, with depression, with bipolar disorder. And we live that mission every day. And it's not just the staff at our national office, but it's our volunteers at our chapter level. It's those that help lead um, our uh, hundreds of support groups around the country, mostly now virtual um, yeah. since, since the pandemic, um, on a weekly basis. Uh, it's the uh, other organizations with whom we partner. Uh, I'm a big believer we can't do this alone. We have to work with and through others yes. uh, to really um, make sure that people living with mental health conditions, in our case, mood disorders, are getting the support that they need, finding the community, the uh, wellness and the hope that they're, um, that they're seeking in their lives so that they can live the kind of lives that any other individual on this planet can live. I definitely agree with. Um, what are some of the pre pressing issues since the pandemic? Yeah. Pandemic's been kind of a two-sided coin, right? I agree with um, you. Uh, you know, the benefits has been uh, just the role technology has played to make support, in our case, peer support, more accessible to more people, assuming that those individuals have access to the technology. Um, I think it's also opened up the conversation. Uh, there's more people talking about mental health yes. than ever before. Yes. It's become less stigmatized, yes. less taboo. Yes. I like to use the word um, more talkable yeah. um, on, a, on an individual family community level. Um, politicians, policymakers are uh, paying more attention to the, uh, the degree of resources made available. And that's just going to allow us to uh, provide more support to more people, uh, to give them more hope. Um, yes. And at the end of the day, um, to me, that's what's so important. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about the pandemic, but, but I agree with you. It, it, there's a lot more awareness. Like I said, you know, you, I watched, I'm in my bedroom watching TV late at night. 
and you know, it happens all the time, you know, like if you have bipolar one, if you have anxiety, if you have, to, it's amazing the commercials that you, that, that wasn't like that 10 years ago mm-hmm. since the pandemic a lot. And unfortunately I have everything, every illness that's on there, you know, <laughs> yeah. but during the pandemic, I, I went through, I was promoting my book and dying at the same time. Or not dying. Yeah, I was dying inside and I, I didn't want to go on mm-hmm. for four months. And I'm going to bring up something. But I'm not going to mention any names, but I had, a, I had somebody I was talking to and I believe I should have been told you need help, like pr- medical help now. But that wasn't the case. So it took me four months of torture to finally get the professional help and uh, take medication. And that saved me. So what, what's your opinion on that? Do you have any opinion on if you're talking to, a, let's say, a therapist and they don't, they don't tell you, look, you better do something, otherwise it's not good. Well, like a lot of things in, in life, you can encourage the people that you love. We can encourage the people that we care about to take certain steps. Um, but often um, individuals have to be ready to make that choice for themselves. Right? Yes. You know, one of our core beliefs is each individual um, needs to find his or her own path to wellness. And um, we can encourage, we can provide facts, we can lay out the consequences, we can express, you know, that emotional plea. Yeah. You know, if, if you won't do it for yourself, will you do it for those of, around you that, that really want to see the best, only the best for you. Um, but at the end of the day, the person has to be ready. And, um, and fortunately, in most cases, when people do act, it's because they're ready and not because they're forced into it. Yeah, I get you. I mean, in my situation, I was... Think, the good thing about me with bipolar and anxiety and depression, whatever I have, I want help. I don't like feeling like that. But, you know, there are, like, not to bring him up again, but like Kanye West, who says he doesn't take medication, and there we have him acting out, whatever that I, you know, that I see. I, um, sometimes you do need the medication and professional help. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I've learned in my time with DBSA is... Um, Medication works effectively for some people, uh, but not everybody. Yes. I've met several people that have said the side effects of the medication I is know. worse than living with the depression or the mania. Um, others find other um, paths and t- towards good treatment. Um, they are fortunate to have the means to access a therapist, but not everybody That's has true. that opportunity. Yes. And there are lots of waiting lists for therapists right now. Um, so that's an, op- you know, that's an option for some. Um, peer support, support groups are, that, that we run around the country, um, now virtually, um, is much more accessible. It's a, not necessarily a replacement for medical treatment, but it can be beneficial to those who um, believe that they will benefit from that. And I think you're going to hear more about that when you, when you talk to Michelle. Yeah. Um, while we have tens of thousands of people that access our support groups, more people come to our website and our other platforms uh, to find other wellness-oriented tools. Right? A, a support group isn't necessarily for everybody, but maybe a podcast is. Uh, or maybe some of the downloadable wellness-oriented tools uh, that give an individual some structure to their day yeah. and their week, yeah. journaling, um, doing self-assessments, uh, a wellness tracker uh, tool, and we offer those on our website, dbsalliance.org. Um, so 
again, back to one of our core beliefs, every individual is going to find their path to wellness. And um, I think encouraging individuals to figure out what that path is for themselves is really, really critical. And then being there, there to support them in that journey. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say in defense of people who they have side effects and everything, I don't have any side effects. So I haven't had that problem. And if I did have side effects, I may have to make that decision. Uh, whether it be gaining weight or feeling a certain way, maybe I would say I'd rather, I'd rather do, do it differently than have to go through the side effects. But for me, there hasn't been any side effects. So it's fantastic. Yeah. All right, what, what is this uh, DBSA Summit? Yeah. Our summit is an event that we'll be holding now for the third consecutive year um, virtually uh, that really is an opportunity to bring um, our community together and to invite others uh, to learn more about our organization. Um, it's kind of a celebration. It's a way for our uh, chapters around the country, our chapter leaders, our facilitators, those that are family members, um, those that want to just learn more about what is depression, what is bipolar, what kind of resources are available, those that want to get involved with public policy and advocacy to share their story in a way that uh, leads to change. It's a way to bring people together, We're offering a number of different uh, workshops and sessions. It'll take place the week of October 10th, and it's, uh, it's online. It's $25 to, to participate for the week. And uh, we hope more people will join us this year. So you just, you, that's amazing. I think that's great. You know, because a lot of people, they just don't have anybody. And, you know, with, with State of Mind, I, I've said it before, but during the pandemic and I was going through that period, I was in the worst shape where there was a lot of bad thoughts going on. Yeah. And... Um, I thought of, well, I prayed a little bit, and then I thought of my family. And then I thought of what would happen if I did something drastic. It would maybe give the other people the permission to do something, mm -hmm. right? And that kind of stopped me from thinking more about what I was planning to do. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, I have thought about not continuing state of mind. And then I, like one time I got a, a letter that said, you know, just a little thing that said, because of you, I feel like I'm not alone. And I think that's what this summit is. You know, having people feel like, they're part of something yeah. when they're going through this. Yeah. It's very important. Yeah. That's our hope, not just with the summit, but um, with all the work that we do yeah. is that individuals won't feel that they're alone, that they'll feel that they have found a sense of community, whatever that community looks like for them, and that by being a part of a community that they're finding wellness. And I've said it before, one of the things I love about our mission statement is one of the first words on our mission statement is uh, to help individuals find hope, right? And our tagline is to find community, find wellness. And the last part of that tagline is to find hope, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm saddened to hear what that four-month four experience must have been like for you. Um, I also hope that um, you found um, a greater sense of hope and purpose. And I, I watch your state of mind uh, uh, podcasts and you provide great hope for lots of people um it's amazing what i would have missed out on and that's what everybody needs to understand when you think your life means nothing when you think you can't go on the bottom line is you can and you just have to take one step forward my wife would say to me, you're stronger than you know, and we are stronger than we know. 
And if I had uh, done what I was thinking of doing, what I would have missed out on. Two more Emmys, state of mind, but more important, what I've gotten. is a joy inside of me that is so peaceful that it's like i if you if i could bottle that up i could sell it for millions of dollars cuz it's such a great feeling i've never had that feeling forever up until now last couple of years after the pandemic before i always had the now I wake up, nothing. It feels just, it feels great to be alive. Yeah. All right. I think we've covered it. Uh, what, what can people, how can people support DBSA? Yeah. Well, I would invite uh, individuals to go to our website, dbsalliance.org. Uh, learn more about the resources that are available. Sign up, subscribe for our newsletter. And uh, if um, your viewers have a partnering organization um, in their local community or at the national level that they think we should get better acquainted with. As I said, we can magnify the yeah. way we uh, make an impact by working with others. That would be great. And we are a nonprofit. Um, we, are, um, we rely on the generosity of our funders and our donors. Uh, consider making a don donation to dbsalliance.org. Wow. All right, listen. Um I always conclude with something that just comes out of my gut. So I just want to say to you, Michael Pollock, this has been amazing. I've learned a lot. I think the audience will learn a lot. Um, I love the way you got deep early on. <laughs> it's like being in the trenches, man. And you just came out of it great. Um, so, uh, We'll continue this friendship, and we'll continue. You, whatever you need from me, you'll get. Yeah. And uh, thank you. <laughs>